Well, hey y'all, Dr. Rich here again with Ask a Former Atheist. I want to talk a little bit today about the school shooting this week out at Appalachie High School in Winder. I used to live in Winder when I was a grad student and shortly after. Um, my oldest daughter, Annabelle, actually went to uh, Winder Barrow High School, the sister high school there in Barrow County of Appalachie. As it turns out, the suspect, I'm not going to mention his name because it's not relevant. Um, I don't want to give a person like that any more attention than what they're looking for. But the suspect in this case uh, attended the same middle school in Jefferson that my two younger daughters, uh, Lydia and Lola, attended. Not the same year, but he was actually a student at that middle school through last... Uh, last May, a year ago May, and then transferred out after, you know, as we know now, after um, being investigated. I'm not sure how or why this happened. I guess more facts will come out, but he ended up transferring out to um, Appalachie, and so he's in a public school there. Um, again, I, from what it seems like, there's a lot I don't know. It seems like a pretty substantial and tragic um, lapse in terms of the system that's in place that should prevent any, anything like that from happening once a person has popped up on a radar um, of the authorities saying that they're planning on perpetrating something like this. Um, so all you could talk about, obviously, guns. We know that the political left is going to make this an issue about guns, of course. Um, like a, a gun decided to fly into the school on its own and start shooting up the place. Uh, we know that didn't happen. Guns ain't the problem, right? Um, guns have been around for a long time. Uh, when I was growing up, everybody had a gun. All the kids, I, you know, I myself had guns on my wall. Everybody had guns. All the kids uh, had rifles and shotguns. And you never heard of anything like this happening. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but um, certainly not the spate of stuff that we see happening nowadays. So what I want to look at are some factors that, you know, as a psychologist, <laughs> I, I, I mentioned myself being a neuroscientist, which is true, but the department that I actually got my doctor, my master's and my doctorate degree in at the University of Georgia was a department of psychology. And I taught in the psychology department there for, you know, a decade or so. Um, and so I'm not a licensed therapist. I didn't go that trajectory or that route. Um, but, you know, I've been around the block. I'm fairly well versed in psychological constructs and ideas and psychodynamics and on down the list there. So I want to talk about some factors. And so the way I was thinking about this, I was talking to Mary Catherine over lunch today. And I said, you know, what would be interesting to me is so many people want to say, well, why does this stuff happen? Why, why, what is it about this particular shooter, this guy? What is it about him? The factors, uh, attributes, activities that he was involved in, what, what, his family life, what was it about him that caused him to do this? Obviously, interesting question. And I'm sure plenty of people have... Um, decided to take that up. And, you know, you probably have some good and reasonable answers. You got some bad ones. Um, but that, but here's my thinking on that. That is the, the typical approach. Why did X, person X, do Y? Okay, why did person X do Y? But I want to kind of flip that around. I want to kind of invert that. And this is what we were talking about over lunch today. The alternate approach would be, why don't 99.999% of young men in today's culture and society, why, why don't they do it, right? We know it's on the rise, it's becoming more common, and so while it's interesting to look in one direction at why it happens, I want to look at maybe a few factors here, why, um, kind of, here's, here's the thinking, because I, I told Mary, I said, her biological son, my stepson, he's like the furthest thing you could get from a kid who would ever do this. Him and his friends, some of the guys that work with us in street ministry, 
we've gotten to know really well, and everything about them is as far away from these school shooter characters, every attribute, everything about their personality, everything about their communication style, how they think, why they think it is like the antithesis on the complete opposite end of the spectrum from the mentality of, um, of these shooters. And so I, I want to look at it from that perspective. And so I have three major points, and then I'm going to tie it into sort of a summary point about parenting. Okay, so let me just give these out, and please let me know what your thoughts are. This is not a comprehensive list. It's just some, I, I was doing some prayer and some meditation through some conversations I've been having. It's been on my mind. Pastor David Holt, at uh, you know my lead pastor at Living Hope Church, where we serve part time, um, mentioned that I you know with my background this would be a great topic for me to do a short video and share some thoughts on. I'm not saying I have it all figured out, but I think I'm I think I'm more right, far more on point with these three things that I'm going to mention than I'm off base. Okay, I'm more right than wrong about these convinced of that. So number one, attributes of kids who would never in a billion years ever even think about doing something like this. Number one, they are affiliated. They're affiliated. They're attached. Okay. They're, they're not autonomous. They don't see themselves as automatons, as autonomous entities, atoms in a, in a world, just doing their own thing in their own little bubble. Okay, they're integrated. They're affiliated with others. There's a lot of ways to accomplish that. It could be sports. It could be band. It could be church youth group. It could be, I mean, just a whole lot of different ways that could play out. But, you know, rather than any specific, the main thing is these kids have been brought up to be affiliated and attached. They're not, they don't see themselves as primarily autonomous entities. Okay, that their friends are not people on the other side of that video game, you know, that they only know th online. I'm not blaming the video games. I don't think they help, okay? I'll be honest with you. I don't think they help build a resiliency. If anything, it is one of many factors that I think kind of moves people in the direction of doing something like this. Obviously, obviously the overwhelming majority of people that play video games even way too much, and they do cause problems in their lives, aren't going out and doing anything like this. So it's not that simple. But I, I would say the psychological characteristic of being affiliated, being attached, not being autonomous, not being, this is my own little microcosm of my world, and this, this sort of mental set that could in, invade that, me versus the world, me versus the rest of society, that's not setting in to their mentality because they're attached, they're affiliated, they've learned how to work together with teams. They learned that it's not all about them, okay? It's not all about, well, you know, just give them, a, put a video in front of their face, put a game set over their eyes and just let them do whatever they want for all day, most days. That is not healthy. And while that won't tend to produce school shooters, it will tend to produce people who are not well adapted, adjusted, to society, okay? So number one, kids, resilient kids, especially younger boys, okay? Affiliated and attached. Number two, agency. Agency. What do I mean by that? Well, agency is the idea of having efficacy over your world, okay? I can affect, I have a power or an ability to affect real constructive change in my social environment. That's a person with agency, okay? The opposite of that, which I would argue is a huge element that predisposes people to grossly antisocial acts like this, is, so the opposite of agency would be fragility, uh, ad adopting a victimhood sort of mentality about the world, okay? The world is just oppressing me in all these different ways, and I, I'm just a victim of circumstances, of society. There's not really nothing I can do about it. It's just where I've landed in life, and I don't have any agency, right? There's a learned helplessness to borrow a psychological term that Seligman 
talked about quite a bit. And, you know, if you take a psychology course, you'll probably learn about learned helplessness. Um, but agency is the opposite of that, okay? So we need young men, young boys who are affiliated and attached. We need young boys who have a real sense of agency. And number three, I would say that, that we need young men who are anchored in objective truth. They're anchored in a reality that is not, that goes beyond social constructs. A reality of objective truth, especially objective moral truth, human value, human worth, that goes far beyond what the system that they're indoctrinated in, in government schools today, um, presents to them. That they're just, each person is just, you know, a little blob, protoplasmic blob of stardust that's been arranged over billions of years by blind evolutionary forces, okay? That's the doctrine of cosmic evolution and then ultimately, you know, life from non-life, abiogenesis, chemicals just self-assembled into cells that over billions of years, and all of these different evolutionary changes, you get giraffes and whales and bats and butterflies and people, you know, another ape species. Um, that's what they're taught, right? They're, they're, they're indoctrinated, even tacitly, um, most of the time, in a worldview that says that there is nothing substantially of unique and lasting, fundamental, objective, eternal um, dignity and moral worth in other human beings. That's not true of you, and that's not true of other people. Okay. Now, usually it's not going to be presented like that to them, but that's the implication of what they learn. And so guess what? If we're just pawn scum evolved to a higher order, again, they're not going to teach it that way, but essentially that's where their theories take you. Okay. We're just stardust banging into itself in a, in, you know, a universe that's unimaginably large. None of us are of any real lasting consequence or value. We're not here for a purpose. There is no meaning to your life other than what you give it. Okay, this is where nihilism and existentialism tried to solve the problem of nihilism but doesn't um, enter the picture of the philosophical discussion. And again, most you don't have teachers going and dry, you know writing on the dry erase board nihilism and um, existentialism. Like you talk about it some maybe in a in a literature course, but they're not being expressly taught this, but everything about the government schools and the bad ideas, the unscientific ideas that are conveyed to our children as if they're settled science, you know, that they're the fifth ape species, that they're chimpanzees with a, you know, slightly modified with a larger frontal lobe. Um, you know, if people believe this stuff about themselves, then, then they're not going to have a basis for connecting with an objective truth and anchoring their person, personal worldview, their understanding of themselves and their understanding of other people in what is truly true, what is objectively true about people, that people themselves and other people have objective moral worth. They have real moral value, okay? We have a true basis for dignity that's not just a social construct, because if we go into social constructs, then we're getting into relativism. Then we're getting into, really, at the end of the day, well, this person's opinion is that people really matter, but I don't believe that. So if life has served me a bunch of lemons, and I'm angsty, and, you know, whatever, I, I'm not dealing well with my problems, then I'll just go grab a gun and shoot a school up. See, that's where it, that the ideas take you guys. This is why it's not about the guns, okay? I mean, that's you understand why they want to do that, why many people in our society, especially on the political left, right? Let's just be, face it. They want it to be about the guns, but, you know, that's not even a relevant conversation to have. Um, yeah, a person, sure, a person who has indicated they have these types of tendencies, uh, a, a parent better not get, be giving that child access to a gun. Uh, where that's shown up as a problem 
you better get the guns out of the house. And the last thing you need to do, and I hope this isn't true, but it seems like it might be, I don't know, is that the father allegedly purchased this young man a, you know, an AR-style gun for Christmas or a birthday or something like that, not long before this. Well, obviously that's just common sense, but that has nothing to do with the idea of responsible gun ownership of American citizens. That is not the issue. The issue is these problems. Um, lack of affiliation, lack of attachment, lack of agency, not being anchored in objective truth, okay? The resilient young people show all of those attributes. Even most kids who don't aren't going to go shoot up a school, but you want to know what we need to address as a society to help ensure against that? Well, you make sure our kids are affiliated and attached. They don't have to be social butterflies. I wasn't. I'm far from it. But there was an emphasis in my generation on that type of attachment and affiliation, okay? Agency. I can do something about my life. The circumstances are, are bad or negative or bring me poor affect. Well, here's something small, even something small I could do to help improve that a little bit. And then finally, you know, my generation was still anchored. The last generation was already slipping away. But most of us were anchored in objective truth. That there is real right, real wrong, real moral good, objective moral good, anchored in a creator who is a personal creator and who cares about how we live our lives and exercises a, a type of accountability over that. That those are true things about the world. You know, one of the things I ran into just a few weeks ago, and it's so relevant here, is a quote from... Uh, well, what, it, what, what I found was Karl Marx, you guys knew who Karl Marx was, right? Das Kapital, sort of the father of socialism and communism, as originally, you know, expressed as an economics theory, proletariat and bourgeoisie and all that, you know, class struggle and those types of issues. Well, you know, Karl Marx was an atheist. He was a, a dialectical materialist, not believe in God. In any way, um, his favorite quote. What was the favorite quote? Uh, Karl Marx being the father of all kinds of terrible ideas that have wreaked havoc on the world and led to so much suffering and so much emptiness and brokenness. What was his favorite quote? Well, Marx's favorite quote is documented as being from Goethe's Faust. And the quote, one of the characters, was this. Everything that exists, everything that exists deserves to perish, okay? Well, take that in, let that sink into your, your brain and, and, you know, kick around in your thinker for a few minutes. Karl Marx has been given a, a to say outsized is an understatement, influence over the modern world and in America today. His favorite quote, the one he identified with the most, was the quote of a character saying, everything that exists deserves to perish. That kind of like, that just says it all, doesn't it? If you adopt that kind of philosophy of life, that sort of, you know, resigned nihilism, um, when, when life gets hard, you're either going to be tempted to check out yourself you're going to retreat into your own little world, become very self-obsessive, start ideating about suicide, self-harm, and or you're going to start really thinking about ways to lash out at others and harm the world that you somehow have come to believe has harmed you or wronged you in some way. Everything that exists deserves to perish, the favorite quote of Karl Marx. And so kind of like tying this together, I was thinking of, um, well, well, parenting. Parenting is obviously the solution, okay? I, I would submit to you that none of these mass shooters had came from a, a well-adjusted family background. And here's the thing about parenting, because I'm a parent, and I would say that many times I fell short of being a great parent, but I was a decent parent. I think I was a pretty good parent, okay? Um, Could have done more, perhaps, in a lot of ways, um, that I seize every opportunity I could have to really coach my children through life? Probably not. Um, but here's the thing about it. 
the need is not for perfect parents or close to perfect parents. The need is for parents doing a little bit of parenting. A little bit of parenting goes a long, long way, okay? Um, just don't mess up too bad, you know? Don't be abusive. Be a, a decent provider and engage your children's life regularly. It doesn't have to be every day. I understand life is hard, people are busy, but enough that we teach our kids how to affiliate, how to attach. We teach them a sense of agency. We teach them to be anchored in objective truth. That's the, the issue. That, that's the level, guys, I'm convinced, where the resolution of this problem. Will it be resolved? I don't know. I certainly pray and hope it does. We Christians know where the answer is. It's not in a social program. It's not in gun laws. It's, it's not in a philosophy department. The answer at the end of the day is in the God-man, the perfect Son of God, Jesus Christ, who, who came to this world to bear witness to the truth, he says, in front of Pontius Pilate, okay? And he came to be God with us. You know, you think of, like, Jesus' life, <laughs> affiliation, attachment, agency, anchored in objective truth. That is the ultimate example of that. The followers of Jesus they were affiliated and attached. They were interactive. They were not autonomous. They, they didn't see lives as their own little microcosm. They had a very big worldview about the kingdom of God. They had a sense of agency, not because they are so powerful, because they trusted in a God who, was he, who they knew was going to lead them to do bold things and courageous things and use them for the purpose of his kingdom and his gospel. And so they had a very robust sense of agency, and ability, again, not in themselves, okay, that might be helpful uh, in a protective sense, but what's much more true is that their sense of agency was bound up in their understanding of God and being empowered by the Holy Spirit to live lives as part of a faith community uh, of followers of Jesus Christ and to, you know, publish his gospel, to proclaim it to the ends of the world. And their worldview was anchored in objective truth. So, you know, just some of my thoughts. I'm sure there's so much more you could say about this. Um, the media is doing their thing, and no doubt most of the legacy media is, is going to do everything they can to make this about, you know, guns, gun control. They're going to do everything they can. They'll probably try to tie it to Trump somehow and militarism and, you know, all of these things. But at the end of the day, guys, that's not what it's about. It's a spiritual issue, okay? It really is about faith. Not a, not a shot-in-the-dark type of faith, but it's about whether we really trust God. Do we, do, we acknowledge, do we acknowledge that God exists, and do we endeavor to please Him, right? Being anchored in objective truth, having agency through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and being affiliated and attached, first and foremost, to God, but also to the body of Christ. If people did that, I guarantee you, the world would change in so many ways. The one thing I guarantee you would never see again is you would never see another school shooting. So once again, my name is Dr. Rich Saplita. Our channel is called Ask a Former Atheist. Subscribe below if you haven't already. Check out our website, www askaformeratheist.com. God bless you and see you soon.